Humans are constantly being attacked by pathogens that are looking to invade and take over our body. So, how do we defend ourselves? That's what we'll learn about in 6.3, Defense Against Infectious Disease. There are many types of pathogens that are constantly trying to enter and infect our body. They range from many commonly known living organisms like tapeworms, bacteria, and fungus, to other non-living viruses like HIV. In order to keep our bodies safe, we have three main lines of defenses against these pathogens. Skin and mucous membranes are the body's first line of defense. The skin provides a physical barrier against the entry of pathogens and also provides protection against physical and chemical damage. It does this by secreting chemicals that lower external pH, making it hard for bacteria and fungus to grow. Mucous membranes are a thinner and softer type of skin that are commonly found in areas like nasal passages and other airways. Mucus is secreted from these areas and is ultimately used to catch pathogens before they enter the body. Once caught, they can be expelled or swallowed and broken down. The skin does a great job of protecting our body, but not when the defense line is broken. If skin is cut, blood vessels are exposed to the outside environment which gives pathogens an opportunity to invade. However, our body has a very important clotting system that works to prevent blood loss and close off the opening, preventing pathogen entry. When a blood vessel is damaged, platelets move to the site and form a temporary plug with red blood cells. The platelets then release clotting factors that set off a chain of reactions. An enzyme called thrombin is released by the clotting factor signal. Thrombin then converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which creates a mesh of strands around the open area that catches more platelets and blood cells, ultimately sealing up the wound. While in this situation blood clotting is good, there can be other situations in the body where blood clotting has a negative effect. Someone who has a buildup of plaque in their arteries could experience the negative effects of blood clotting. If the plaque ruptures and begins to bleed, clotting factors work to plug the opening. This time, the mesh of fibrin, because it's in an artery, will stop the bleeding but also completely block all blood flow within the artery. This is how someone experiences a heart attack, which is extremely dangerous and could be fatal. The innate immune system is our body's second line of defense. This type of defense gives us a non-specific and non-adaptive type of response, meaning that it works the same way every time and consumes anything it comes across. The majority of this work is done by cells called phagocytes. These cells engulf and ingest foreign pathogens, aka eat them, to keep us protected. They do this through the process of endocytosis, as you can see in the image below. The phagocyte grabs the pathogen, engulfs it, breaks it down with enzymes found in the lysosome, and presents pieces of the pathogen as antigens on the surface of the cell that work with the body's third line of defense. The third line of defense is carried out by the adaptive immune system. With adaptive immunity, we no longer have a one-size-fits-all policy, and the body can now create antibodies, which are molecules that seek out and help to destroy very specific pathogens. When a phagocyte presents an antigen from a pathogen it destroyed, it hooks up with a helper T cell. If the T cell reads the antigen as being foreign, it gets activated and releases chemical messages called cytokines that activate B cells. B cells then work to produce specific antibodies that can find more of the same pathogens. These antibodies latch onto the pathogen, giving it a mark that enhances the immune system's ability to recognize and destroy that particular pathogen. This complex system is our best defense against pathogens that have made it past the first two lines of defense. HIV is a nasty virus that infects our immune system. This virus targets T cells used by our adaptive immune system. HIV infects and kills T cells, which means that our third line of defense cannot work properly. This leaves our body defenseless against pathogens that would normally not be a problem for our body to fight off. This graph shows what happens to the number of T cells once a person gets infected by HIV. At first, there is a dramatic decline in T cells that brings about symptoms of acute HIV syndrome. 
Then, the virus goes into a dormant state during this clinical latency phase, only to become active again later, which can ultimately lead to the death of the human host. HIV can be transmitted via unprotected sex, pregnancy and breastfeeding, sharing of needles, exposure to infection if you work in the medical field, or by blood or organ transfusions. Antibiotics are chemicals that kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria by targeting prokaryotic metabolism. A common example of an antibiotic is penicillin. Penicillin was identified by Alexander Fleming in 1928 on accident. This chemical came from a mold called penicillium, and when placed next to other bacteria, he noticed that it inhibited their growth. Years later, two other scientists named Ernest Chain and Howard Florey infected mice with pathogenic bacteria to see if penicillin would destroy the pathogen and cure the host. With an experiment of only using eight mice, they were successful and started to immediately treat humans that had bacterial infections. The use of antibiotics, while it may be good, also comes with a price. Bacteria are evolving because of increased antibiotic use and now carry genes that make them resistant to antibiotics, which is a scary thought leading to our medically advanced future. As a side note, I need to mention that antibiotics only work at stopping bacterial infections and not viral infections. Viruses do not have a cell metabolism of their own, which means that these chemical compounds have no effect with stopping them. This is where antiviral medication comes into play. But these days, antibiotic use is so widespread that certain bacteria have built resistance to most, if not all, of the antibiotics that we have synthesized. Some of these bacteria can even transfer their resistant genes to other species via horizontal gene transfer on plasmid DNA. These multi-drug surviving species are called pan-resistant bacteria. This is a double-sided coin because using antibiotics can potentially cure us of infections, but also gives bacteria an opportunity to evolve and build resistance. We, as conscientious citizens, need to use antibiotics properly and only when necessary to preserve the high effectiveness of the drugs we create. If widespread misuse continues to be a norm, we will find ourselves in a situation where more and more bacteria evolve to build resistance, which could ultimately lead to dire consequences for our future.